like we have most everybody. So let's go ahead and take a look at this week in programming. Foundations of programming. Let's take a look at our grade book. See, March 5th is this coming Sunday. So we are on 5.02. Last week was our number systems lesson where we looked at uh, the different number systems, hex, decimal, binary, and decimal. Now we're talking about ASCII. ASCII, we're going to learn what ASCII is today. So let's go to 5.02, decoding ASCII. All right, decoding code. Every time you hit a key on your keyboard or type a message, something magic happens. Before the characters appear on the screen, there's a lot of things happen inside your computer, inside your phone, inside whatever computer you're using. The computer changes every character to a number. That makes it binary, right? Because computers can only read binary. So they got to take anything you type and convert it to numbers and translate it into, into code. So the translate code is actually standard, which means whenever you type an A, it always assigns the same number to A. That's universal. So when it sends it to another phone, like maybe you send it to an, an iPhone from a, from a Windows phone, or an Android phone, it's going to use the same character so the other computer can understand what you're typing. So we're going to look at the difference between data and information and how ASCII and Unicode standards represent characters in this lesson. So let's look at page two. So here's a table, A, B, C, D, E, and here is the decimal equivalent that's assigned now. When you type an A, it's going to change it to 65. Of course, it's going to show it in binary. That's how you put 65. This is, a, this is one, then the two spot, four spot, eight spot, 16, 32, 64. So that's a 64 to one, which equals 65. So there is the first five letters of the alphabet and the decimal equivalent of the number assigned to it. But again, it assigns it in binary. Oh, and look here. A whole big table all these characters you can use the ascii equivalents so from macs to pcs to mobile devices we enter data words numbers whatever we're entering that we want to share with others so it transfer translates it to binary right so every character type even when you hit space when you hit a space, it'll convert that to a binary. So, so that way a different computer can open it and read it back the same way. It converts it back. So, but what if your computers are different types, like a PC and a Mac? This is where ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Exchange, ASCII, comes in. All right, this is the uh, standard for exchanging information. There's a special code that all machines use to receive and deliver data. All right, so the standard code will allow computers to translate it into the form of special characters. So you know, A is a 65, as we saw in the chart. S is a 01010011, which is 83, 83 in decimal. C is on the chart, that's 67. And then the I is 73. And you'll see both I's will be the same because it always uses the same number assigned to each letter. So every character in your keyboard has its own specific ASCII value. And it's equivalent to eight bits. Eight bits, because there's just eight. There's these seven. There can be eight, depending on long. Some letters have a bigger number, so it goes past the seven it shows here. So here's the difference between data and information. Data is a collection of quantities or characters computers use to perform operations like a test score, that would be data, the specific data, the actual test score is the data the computer uses. Information is the collection of values derived from the data. That is meaning like the average of all your test scores, that's information, that's not data. The data is the actual test scores that it looks at. It takes all the data and compiles it into an average, which is your information about your test score. So that's the difference between data and information. Data is specific values, where information is looking at a collection of values. 
looking at page three here let's talk about unicode ascii's great but it's limited to only 256 characters because it's limited to eight bits and eight bits maxes out at 256 characters and it's designed for languages that use the latin alphabet right in our current global economy it's it's common for people to communicate across many different languages so what if you need to translate into chinese or arabic who do not use our latin alphabet that's where unicode unicode is a global code that covers many more characters than ascii unicode comes in globally there's a need for many more characters and symbols essentially making your computer multilingual so unicode expands over a million characters with more being added as needed. So for example, emojis. Emojis are Unicode. How do you send an emoji to someone else? It, the computer has to translate it into Unicode. So while a winking emoji may look a little different depending on where you type it, right? Because each computer is going to interpret that winking emoji to look different. So use Facebook, Google, or Apple device, whatever. You're going to see that look a little bit different. The Unicode character value will always be the same. So right here, when you click on this, the Unicode for the winking face emoji is 1F609. Now, what that 1F609 looks like on your device will be different depending on how Apple programmed that or Facebook programmed that or whoever programmed that uh, for a winking face. It will be a winking face. It will just have its own look depending on the company. The crown, 1F451. And F goes back to the hexadecimal, right? A, B, C, D, F. That's like the number 15 in hexadecimal. Uh, the praying hands is 1F, 64F. Uh, these symbols over here, the omega, 03A9 is the Greek omega. You're going to see the donut like that one, F369, 1F369. So you have all these different characters. The Unicode for the euro symbol, instead of the dollar sign, this is the euro symbol, 20AC. So, oh, and here's a little did you know fact. Let's look at this. Computers can understand many characters and symbols, but they can't read them very well. Oh, that's very true. That's very true. Some companies use this weakness to tell the difference between humans and computers online. You see one of these little boxes occasionally that it puts a little swirly, twisted, disordered kind of letters. It's called a CAPTCHA. 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 That's where it has twisted and distorted letters. So computers can't read that to fill that blank in. They don't, they, they struggle with that. So that's how they tell it's a human person using the website and not some computer bot that is filling out information. Right. So that's why they use these little things here because computers can't read very well. They can interpret all day long. That doesn't mean they can read what they're interpreting. At least not yet. Encoding and decoding. So humans have been using code for as long as we've existed, like early hieroglyphics, where images represent ideas and language. Some are unwritten, like the friend code that says, hey, we all have to use the bathroom at the same time, right? I'm going to the bathroom corner. Let's go with me. That, I think that's more of a girl thing than a guy thing. But generally, uh, it's a friend code. But now we're talking about computer code, encoding and decoding. When you encode something, you take data and you translate it into a code. That's what your computer does when it turns your data into ASCII characters. That's encoding something. Now, decoding it is putting it back to where we can understand it. Human readable info. When we decode something, you're thinking of decoding a secret message so you can read it. So it's a huge part of human communication. Early aviation radio used Morse code. See that you, you have Morse code. And you have to decode that to be able to understand what it is. During the World Wars, systems were used to prevent, prevent enemies, right? So uh, some very important jobs in World War I, World War II is trying to figure out the code that the enemy was using. So here's Alan Turing. Alan Turing's a very important part of uh, developing the computer. He was known as the father of computer science. There's some movies out there about Alan Turing. You can look up and, and see some really good. I've seen more than one. Um, as a well-known cryptographer, he worked as a code breaker for the British government during World War II, and he broke the Enigma code that was used by Nazi Germany. And he created a computer to do it. It's pretty cool. There's, like I say, I've seen some, some movies about that. Let's take a look at how the process works. So if we want to see what the ASCII translation is this, let's hit a Y. Okay, that's 89. 
we looked at A earlier, it was 65, and B was 66, and C was 67, but this goes into some of the other ones. The two is 50. See, 40, and these are all going in order. All up there. The equal sign is a 61. Uh, the space is a 32. The enter is a 13. So this just going to let you look at all these to see their ASCII translation. All right, hit next. All right. C, translate to see the following message encoded. This is taking all those ASCII codes for each letter and printing out the ASCII values. So you could translate this. You could go back and go back to the last one. 89. What is 89? Well, let's see. 85. Uh, where's 89? 89 is a Y. So this starts with a Y. We can translate the whole thing right here. Oh, there's that Y. You can use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. That's said by Frank Lloyd Wright, who was an architect. So he just basically say you can fix it while you're still making the plans, or if you don't fix it now and have to fix it after you built it, then you got to use a sledgehammer. So good quote there. And number three, use the ASCII chart to encode this message on your own. Well, here's the three possible quotes. So this was actually a lot easier than it looks. You can definitely decode all of that, but since they already told us the three choices and they have a different first letter, all we got to know is what 73 is, and that'll tell us which one of those is. Y, U, or I? Is it Y? Nope. U? Nope. It's I. So we know it's got to be this one. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. It's a Steve Jobs quote. Submit. Excellent job. Crack the code. And that was just by looking at the first letter because they're all different. But 110, 110, that would also tell us it's the second, third character are the same. O, o U, N, L, N, N. So that also tells us it had to be the third one. But this is something you can play with. All right. Encoding and decoding in Python. So how do we do this in Python? Because that's what we're going to be doing this week. Python has an easy way to do this. If you want to put something into ASCII, you use CHR, parentheses, parentheses, short for the character function. Use the character function to encode into ASCII. And decode, use the ORD, ordinal. Ordinal refers to a numerical position or an order. The ordinal function decodes characters back to their numeric value. So that's how you convert back. So you can put something in the ASCII by using the character function and back in the ordinal for this. So here it is, a very short program. Define main print character, which is the ASCII of 65. The character 65. And it'll print an A. <coughs> and then print the ordinal of A and it'll print 65 main. Very quick, short, going both directions. So let's look at the sample programs they have for us this week, and they have four of them. All right, read over the code, predict the output. You know, it's the ASCII code, define main, print ordinal of A. So that'll print that 65, right? And then the SCII, we saw those on the other page. And then it'll print the ordinal for the exclamation mark. And then print character 65, 83, 67, 73, 73, 33. And that's the end of the program. So let's run it. There it is. It prints the ASCII values and then prints the word ASCII explanation. So these are the same thing. These are the values for these letters and that exclamation mark. Exclamation marks are 33. So it prints this and then the equivalent that we can read. So let's go look at the next one. Read over this, run, look at the output, select next when you're ready. Okay. Define main, print. I need three. It's going to specifically print that. And then it's going to print character 189. Whatever 189 is, Nasky. Space, feet of fabric for this project. I need three. Whatever, what character do you think it is? That's a, probably the little single quote. That generally designates feet, but then you shouldn't have to put feet of that. It is 85, character 176, and cloudy today. It would make sense. That's probably the little character for degrees. Um, print 
whatever the character 191 is plus C plus character 243 Mote Lamas. So this is a quote in a different language, apparently. Uh, print solve three and then actually this character plus four plus this character and then a period at the end. In London, gas cost this character's $1.15 per liter. So it's probably a euro. That's probably the euro symbol, euro 115 per liter. And that's in a message. So let's run it and see what it looks like. 60. Oh, it's a half. Okay. So that character 29 is a half. So I need three and a half feet of fabric for this project. It is 85 degrees. Yeah, it's a little degree symbol. Uh, there is the little upside down question mark that's used for that language. Solve three squared plus four squared. So that's what this character 178 is. It's the squared symbol. And in London gas cost, that is the leader symbol, $1.15 per liter. So yeah, you can access all these different ASCII characters. Let's go to the next one. ASCII code, define main, message. And it's got this whole list, right? It's creating a list because it's using the bracket. So message creates this whole list of ASCII values. And then new message starts out empty. There's nothing. New message equals nothing. So then they've created a for loop. 4M in message. New message equals new message plus the character M, which M will start at the beginning and as the loop goes it'll keep going till it gets to the end of that list and it's adding it to new message so it's going to put them in order together and then print it so let's run that there it is so the first one's a t an h e that's a space and then s a f e apostrophe s and a space and so what it does is it takes that list puts it all together as the characters, you know, as each one, it takes each one as a character and adds it to the new message variable. And at the end, it just prints it out. So the saves combo. So this is this is a program to basically uh, put your saves combination there where nobody can read it because it's in ASCII. So this program decodes that to where you can read it and see what the saves combo is because it's all in ASCII up there. All right, let's look at the last example they give us. Define main, message equal, treasure map hidden behind painting. Code message, and it creates an empty list. Code message is an empty list. And so for M and message, code message append, which means add this to the list. If you remember our list lesson, append means, hey, take this value and add it to my list. And then whatever the list is, take this value and add it. So this loop, this for loop, takes the ordinal of M, from from the message like it'll take the t convert it to ascii and add it to this list take the r ascii add the list and then for c in code message print c so then it prints that list run program okay treasure map hidden behind painting so this is the opposite of the last program this mess this will take whatever message you want and convert it convert it to ASCII code for you. So this could be your coded message that you send to somebody else. Then they run the program to decode it and it tells them treasure map hidden behind painting. So this is getting into coding messages and then decoding messages. So if you want to create an encoded message, the ordinal function is how you do that. All right. So let's look at, that's the last of that. Let's look at our assignment for the week. Here's the assignment template. Three parts, program, part one's the programming. Think of a secret message you want to encode. So you're gonna come up with your own secret message. Be creative. You can use a famous quote if you want, or a lyric, or your personal model, whatever you want your secret message. That's where you have that total freedom there. And then you're gonna use the ordinal and character functions to encode and decode the message. And here's some optional stuff. Number three is totally optional. You do not have to do any of these unless you'd like to. You can have the user guess the message for revealing it. Input, what do you think the message is? All right. Uh, 
you can display the message in binary if you want. That's an option. You don't have to do that. We're just talking about ASCII and then decoded to where we can read it. And, and you can add a twist. You could you could add two to every binary number, so that would make it even harder to decode because they oh this is binary, and then when they check the binary code, it wouldn't match because it's off by two. So when you decode it, you'd have to reverse that. You have to subtract two before you put it back. So those, like I said, number three is optional. So you don't have to do that. You do have to use the ordinal and character functions to encode and decode the message. Print the encoded and decoded messages to the screen. So you're going to come up with that message and you're going to print out the ASCII coded message. And then you're going to print out the decoded message you can read. So be sure to write the pseudocode, your little plan on what you're going to do. Right. I'm going to define main. I'm going to put my comments with my name and stuff. I'm going to define main. I'm going to set this value to this quote. I'm going to encode that into ASCII. I'm going to print the ASCII version. I'm going to decode that in using the ordinal, put it back into characters and print the print the message. Uh, code the program using program idle, use your comments. Have make, don't forget the heading has your name, date, and short description of the program. Uh, I was in a, several computer program classes when I was in college that you write the program and you just turn in the program, print it out on printer paper from the computer. So if you didn't have your name in the program, professor has no idea whose program that is, and they just trash it, give a zero. But follow the Python style conventions regarding indentation white space and use meaningful variable names. So that's just the standard stuff we do all the time. Uh, this is an example of what yours may look like. Here's the encoded message, and it prints this whole list of the whole message right there in ASCII. And then the decoded message. Try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. It's an Albert Einstein quote. So, encoded, decoded message. Insert a copy of your code there, and then, of course, you have your postmortem review questions. All right. So, if you need to look up uh, ASCII symbols, probably do that just in, in Google. Get a whole ASCII chart. See, ASCII chart. Here we go. Just Googled it up, and here is a whole ASCII chart. Notice a capital A is 65, where a small A is 97. All right, what's it expanding to? Oh, see, it gives you everything. The decimal, the hexa hexadecimal, the binary, the HTML, the character. No. So do you want that first number? Because we're doing we're doing decimal. We're saying, oh, it's a 65. Capital A, but if you need any of these other things, question marks, colon, semicolon, you know, any of these other characters, you can look all of that up pretty simply in a chart. And I think it's actually in, in Python as well, but I haven't pulled it up there. That's it. And here's the rubric I'll be using to grade it right underneath it. Your design. Do you have all the elements that you need? Your programmer name and date. Do you have the comments that explain the purpose of your program? Is it indented correctly? To use meaningful variable names when you use them. Uh, for up to 40 points that you clearly reflect the pseudocode. Use the main function, use the ordinal and character. Uh, then decoded and encoded message are neatly displayed. And then 30 points for the performance. Does it run correctly with no errors and produce what it's supposed to produce? And then 20 points for that postmortem review. So if you skip those questions, you, you've lost 20 points already. So, all right. That's it. That is our assignment. We're going to play with some messages so you get to choose whatever you want to encode and decode. You know, have fun with that. Choose, choose some fun quote. Find some famous quote or make up something of your own. It's kind of fun and have some fun with it. So any questions on that? Not too complicated of a program this week. We're just converting to ASCII and then converting back. That's That's not too bad. So not a terribly long program it doesn't appear so. all right well you've got your assignment you may go have a great week we'll see you wednesday if you need to be here